The obscure, unsolved mysteries iceberg consists of hundreds of topics, from bizarre disappearances, alternative hidden history, some truly horrific cryptid encounters, to some of the most mind-numbing conspiracy theories. In this video, we'll be covering a number of them, diving from the surface to the darkest depths. But before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about this video's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid is a completely free-to-play hero battle RPG. It's already played by over 80 million players worldwide. I'm going to tell you all about my favorite new faction in Raid, the elusive and mysterious Sylvan Watchers. The Sylvan Watchers made their home in the Mistwood, a huge jungle in the east of Teleria. Don't expect to walk in the park if you try to visit the Sylvan Watchers. There's a ton of variety in the faction, with each champion being linked and in tune with the Mistwood. Wood jungle. The Sylvan Watchers tribe is made up of forest elves, tree spirits, and living rock monsters. And this Christmas, get ready to celebrate the 12 Days of Raid. All new players, click the link in my bio and download Raid Shadow Legends, and then go to 12daysofraid.plarium.com and enter your player ID. Then set out on a fun, festive adventure that lasts 12 days for a chance to win some amazing in-game and real-life prizes, even Amazon gift cards, worth up to $1,000. Existing Raid players don't think they're leaving you out. Head to 12 Days of raid.plarium.com where you can find a special holiday promo code that everyone can use for a small festive gift. But hurry, the event ends January 10th. The newest legendary champion in Raid is none other than MMA and pro wrestling champion Ronda Rousey, which you can get for free right now just by logging into Raid. Log in and play Raid for 7 days anytime between now and February 20th and Ronda's yours. Enter the promo code Raid Ronda for a 3-day 100% XP boost, 500,000 silver, and 5 full energy refills. If you haven't started playing Raid yet, click my link in the description or scan the QR code here on the screen, and you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. That's an epic champion, Chanaru, an energy refill, an entire day's XP boost, 200,000 silver, and an epic skill tome, all for free, just by clicking my link in the description or scanning the QR code on screen now. So download Raid Shadow Legends and start playing today, and a huge thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. On August 13, 1997, iconic shock jock, radio talk show host Howard Stern got his own once-in-a-career shock when a man going by the name Clay called the show, claiming to be a serial killer. And Howard answered the call, live on air. So maybe uh, he, he thinks I have an answer. Is this Ed? Ed? No, this isn't Ed. No. Oh. You haven't killed any bro- <laughs> No, I never said my name was Ed. Oh. Oh. Sorry. That's yeah, okay. What's your what name do you use? You can call me Clay. Clay? Clay? <laughs> yes, Clay. Okay, Clay. So what happened? How many prostitutes have you killed? Twelve. At first, thinking the call was a hoax, Howard badgered the caller, asking if he was abused or insinuating that he was some sort of incel. But as the call goes on, Clay describes in a cold and casual demeanor some of his different crimes, how they happened, and surprisingly gives multiple details about himself. How else did you kill him? Well, a few times, actually, most times with a hammer. Hmm. And where do you do this primarily? Uh, I've done it twice in a parking garage, and then the rest of the time's on the side of the road. And, uh, you're from the New Orleans area? Yes. Hmm. I, I knew I, I had, I really had it planned out. Hmm. You know, I wanted to do the whole sending clues. Right. Oh yeah. Are you in? To baffle people, but it turned out no one noticed for a long time. Right. Like, what, like you killed her on the side of the road. Uh, her. That was the parking garage. Okay. And then what'd you do with the body? You dumped that somewhere? Um. Yeah, actually, I think uh, she's probably one of the ones that they found. Yeah. Howard and Robin cleverly obtain a surprising amount of details about not only Clay, but the location of his crimes, where he finds his victims, their race and genders, but also he laughs about a suspect in one of the cases. You got a wife? I mean, you got a mom, a dad, a wife, children, you got any of that? I've got a couple of kids, but um, I... No wife? I'm not married to the mother. Mm -hmm. You're a white guy? 
Oh, uh, yeah, Howard, that's pretty funny because the only suspect they had when they started finding the bodies was a black police officer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Turns out one of them uh, was associated with them. Oh, really? Uh. So, from what we hear in the show, Clay was hunting down female sex workers, mostly African American, in New Orleans, and had stopped for nearly a year as of August 1997, and that at one point, the police had wrongly suspected a male African American police officer. From all of this information, we can gather that Clay was most likely the Storyville Slayer. The Storyville Slayer is the nickname given to an unknown American serial killer who slayed at least 24 sex workers between 1991 and 1996. Almost all of the victims were African American women from ages 42 all the way down to a 17 year old. While the cause of death varies, the suspect almost always dumped the victims in swamps, rivers, or canals near highways. Due to the isolated locations of the dumping sites, the victims' bodies were left in water spanning from several weeks to several years resulting in extreme decomposition and destruction of incriminating evidence. Some of the victims have never been identified. And here's the kicker. The first major suspect in these heinous crimes was police officer Victor Gant. Gant grew up in New Orleans and spent a majority of his youth in Algiers, which is the same area that a number of the victims disappeared from. After Gant came a police officer in 1980, he spent much of his patrol in the red light districts, becoming very familiar with the criminal element and befriending young sex workers. On December 9, 1990, Gant's roommate, Sharon Robinson, arrived at the emergency room, battered and bruised with a broken nose. When the police responded, she accused Victor Gant of beating her. Gant denied the accusation, but was again accused by both Robinson's children and the emergency room doctor who had to set her nose. In the early months of 1995, a disciplinary hearing was to take place to determine Gant's punishment. The key witness was, of course, Sharon Robinson, who was found dead before she could give her testimony on May 5, 1995. According to investigators, Gant had killed both her and her friend, Karen Ivester, in order to get rid of them. According to friends and acquaintances of the victims, Gant held a personal grudge against Ivester and had spoken negatively about her on multiple occasions. In order to determine whether or not he was guilty, Gant was ordered to submit DNA for testing to match against saliva that was found on a piece of chewing tobacco near Ivester's body. The results were inconclusive and no charges were filed against Gant, who was later dismissed from the force in August of 19. So you could see why Gant was a suspect in the Storyville Slayer case. But the call into the Howard Stern show caused a huge amount of public attention on the case, leading to more scrutiny on the police force. So they started going over every file they had, and eventually, investigators found something that had slipped through the cracks. Late one night, during enhanced patrols of the areas where the victims were going missing and the dump sites in 1994, 43-year-old Russell Elwood was caught by police, masked in his car in the middle of nowhere. Elwood's car was parked just off the road, exactly where you'd have to park to dump victims, Cheryl Lewis, and Dolores Mack's bodies. Russell claimed he had pulled over to change his brake pads and oil, but had none of the supplies to do either. He didn't even have a flashlight. It's unclear what happened after that, but in 1997, after finding files regarding this incident, the task force investigating the Slayer tracked Elwood down and booked him as a suspect. Once located, Elwood was informed of his rights, and within three days gave several statements recorded on tape. During the interrogations, he admitted to frequenting black sex workers throughout his life, claiming that he knew more than 100 girls. The investigators became increasingly suspicious when Elwood started speaking about having a dream in which he was being questioned about a series of murders, and later admitting to frequenting the locations where the bodies were found, but continued to reaffirm his innocence. On August 4, 1997, just days after the interrogations were completed, Elwood was arrested for buying illicit substances from an undercover police officer at his home in Sebring. As a result, he was convicted and sentenced to spend 85 days in the county jail. Elwood implicated himself in the killings back in New Orleans and its various suburbs. One of them, Stan Hill, contacted the county prosecutor's office and claimed that Elwood had described it to him in detail, how he had driven a woman to outlying areas of the city, offering them large quantities of illicit substances that caused overdoses, then strangled her and dumped her body. Elwood both posted to multiple inmates about how he was wanted for more than 60 murders within the state of Louisiana. 
After his release, Elwood returned to Canton to live with his brother, but based on Hill's testimony, the task force tracked him down again and re-interviewed him, this time in the presence of Ron Camden, a 27-year veteran of the Cincinnati Police Department's homicide unit. During interrogation, Elwood initially denied making any such statements to the inmates, but after hearing a tape of Hill's testimony, he admitted that he had indeed boasted to Hill. Ron Camden later testified that Elwood also confessed to him that he had killed an African-American girl, whose corpse he had dumped in a canal, but no recording of this confession was taken, and Elwood later denied ever confessing to any crimes to Camden. Elwood later claimed that mental illness had caused him to boast, demanding that the interrogation cease and he be allowed to return to New Orleans, see his attorney, and seek medical treatment. This request was denied, whereupon Elwood confessed to killing Lewis and Mac, but refused to be audiotaped, and soon after, began denying that he had confessed. Eventually, while incarcerated for failure to appear, authorities Authorities charged Elwood with the murders of Lewis and Mack on March 4, 1998. Elwood was found guilty of killing Cheryl Lewis and was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole on August 17, 1999. But that accounts for just one of the 27 victims and another wrinkle in the story. The call to the show took place on August 18, 1997, but Elwood had been arrested on August 4, 1997. So, are Russell Elwood and Clay one and the same, or is the Storyville Slayer? still at large. In 2007, in Fircrest, Washington, 16-year-old Courtney Key Kendall's friends randomly begin receiving texts from her cell phone, simply reading, gay. When they started texting her back thinking it was a prank, she thought the same thing, except there was a problem. Although Courtney swears she never sent those texts, her friends had received them from her number. Confused at the strange occurrence, she brushed it off and thought no further of it. She had no idea this was the first test of a madman's bizarre psychotic stalking technology. Shortly after the first incident, Courtney, along with her friends and family, started receiving threatening text messages and phone calls from an unknown person who they all later referred to as Restricted, as that was the name that would appear on the caller ID when he called. During these calls, Restricted would threaten to murder or sexually assault Courtney's friends and family, kill their pets, and even threaten to attack the schools they attended. When Restricted got to the point of constantly harassing all members of the family's phones day in and day out, everyone affected switched phones, changed their numbers, and even changed their service providers. But nothing seemed to work. After one particularly active night of the family being constantly awoken by their new phone line ringing off the hook all night, they called the police. But while they were on the phone with the police describing what had happened, Happened. All of their phones began to ring, the calls coming from each other. The police eventually traced some of the calls and texts back to Courtney's phone, accusing her of lying for attention and basically creating a hoax. But this was impossible. Even when Courtney would shut her phone off for multiple days in a row, her friends would begin receiving texts from her phone, threatening her unless she turned it back on. But their situation would seem to take an even darker turn. The key Kendalls had a brand new security system installed, and as soon as the installer left, restricted calls and recited the six-digit key code Mr. Key Kendall had entered in multiple times setting up the system. He began commenting on the family's clothing day-to-day -day and on conversations they were having in private, leading the family to wonder was restricted watching them or perhaps somewhere inside the house. Their worst fears would become reality one evening as Courtney was chopping limes. Restricted called saying only, I prefer lemons, before hanging up. One evening, an unknown person banged on the side of the family's house before running off into the darkness. At this point, taping their camera lenses and even removing the batteries from their phones failed to stop the stalker. The harassment and non-stop calls and texts unraveled the family into a living nightmare. Restricted constantly reminding the family that he had no intention of stopping and that the police weren't even trying to find him. And as far as we know, no one ever did. It's unclear why, but the Key Kendall story slowly trailed off. Whether or not they ever found out who was harassing them or why they stopped, if they stopped, is unknown.
On December 15, 1967, during peak evening rush hour traffic, the Silver Bridge, a 40-year-old suspension bridge in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, suddenly and unexpectedly collapsed, resulting in the tragic deaths of 46 people, two of which were never found. But strangely, some of the inhabitants of Point Pleasant, a small town tucked into the border of West Virginia and Ohio, claimed to have seen a horrifying entity known as the Mothman shortly before the disaster, and many people now believe the Mothman to have been some kind of warning of the impending tragedy. Even stranger, the man who made the Mothman a household name, John Keel, with his book Mothman Prophecies, believes he may have encountered something even darker when researching his book on location in Point Pleasant, and various research into Mothman cryptid encounters have uncovered several bizarre theories. On November 12, 1966, five gravediggers in Clendenin, roughly 75 miles away from Point Pleasant, saw what they believed to be a winged man gliding directly over their heads before dipping down, weaving through the tops of trees before disappearing. The gravediggers claimed to have observed the strange being for about a minute, all five seeing the same thing. If the sightings and rumors are true, it seems the Mothman was on his way to his new home. The TNT area in Point Pleasant refers to an area that was once a top-secret munitions plant during World War II. But after the nuclear weapons were used on Japan, the site was quickly shut down and abandoned. On the night of November 15, 1966, Steve and Mary Malik were taken a drive with their friends Robert. Roger and Linda Scarberry, when suddenly, a dark figure appeared in the road ahead of them. Steve was driving and probably had the best view of the figure. He describes it clearly as being a dark, humanoid creature, roughly six or seven foot tall, which then expanded its wings out to its sides, showing what appeared to be a ten-foot wingspan. But the creature's glowing red eyes struck fear into his heart. Linda didn't see the creature's arms or wings, but did see a dark mass and the horrifying glowing red eyes. As the car approached and began to slow down, the Mothman took off scaring the four motorists and causing them to drive away at high speeds. But to the group's horror, they quickly noticed that the creature had followed them, seeing its massive wings flapping and its burning red eyes gleaming in the rear view mirror. Even when Steve's car reached 100 miles per hour, the creature kept up with it. The flying monster eventually broke off from its pursuit, and Steve drove the group straight to the sheriff's office and arrived at around 2 a.m., filing a report, and just like that, the Mothman legend was born. Once the story got out, other residents of Point Pleasant began to come forward with sightings of the Mothman, one pointing out that the many buildings of the abandoned TNT site power plant were populated by hundreds of pigeons, all except for one, and that they thought this would be the Mothman's lair. Another resident speculated that the chemical runoff from the munitions plant into the Ohio River was to blame, causing mutations in a local sandhill crane, a theory that some still support to this day. Hundreds of reports were made for an entire year between 1966 and 1967. That was, until the tragedy on December 15, 1967 the bridge collapse. Now, to be clear, the bridge did suffer a catastrophic failure of a single eye bar in the suspension chain, which caused it to wear down over time and eventually fail, but there were extremely unfortunate events that made the tragedy much, much worse. For example, the stoplights that were on either side of the bridge both froze up on red, causing the traffic to pile up, completely filling the bridge with cars, causing the death toll to probably be much higher than it would have been. Of course, a real-life massive disaster like this would snap residents out of the buzz of a possible local cryptid, but it didn't last for long. Some believe the Mothman to be somehow responsible for the bridge collapse. Some claimed he arrived as some kind of dark omen of a coming event. To those who landed on the theory that he was trying to warn the residents of Point Pleasant, I'd have to say he didn't do a great job. Nowadays, some Point Pleasant residents are comfortable with the local legend being what their town is now known worldwide for, fostering a booming tourism business while not taking the whole thing too seriously. But while John Keel was in town researching his book, which would put the Mothman on the world stage and even give way to a major motion picture, The Mothman Prophecies, with Richard Gere. The Mothman wasn't the only mysterious happening he heard about. John maintains that the bridge collapsing was highly improbable without some kind of foul play or sabotage, and remarked that the FBI got involved in the investigation, making sure that it was explained and the narrative of structural failure to be implemented as quickly as possible. Keel also mentions that the sightings didn't stop completely after the collapse, more that they continued 
continued, but for some time, nobody really felt comfortable coming forward due to the very real trauma the town was now dealing with. According to John, it was during his investigation that he stumbled upon another dark rumor. When investigating whether or not the Mothman could be some kind of large predatory bird, Keel was tracking where it could be living, as it would have to have a steady food source to maintain its huge size, leading to investigators searching nearby caves and wildlife areas. According to John Keel, there had been a serial killer loose in the area, and that during one of these searches, authorities discovered a cave full of dozens of decomposing human bodies, and that they never had any kind of suspect. So what is going on in Point Pleasant? Is there a dark entity lurking in the shadows? And who was this serial killer that was never caught? We most likely will never know. Okay guys, that's all I got for you today. If you're still watching, leave a like and comment, and make sure you're subscribed. I hope you all had a wonderful holiday, and I'm putting together a new little set and have lots of great videos in the works. So Happy New Year, and I will see you very soon in the next video. The End by Max Powers